Stanley Park is a green oasis beside Vancouver's downtown and West End. Surrounded on three sides by water, it may be Canada's favorite city park. It's even been voted the top park of the entire world on at least one survey. It became Vancouver's first park in 1886. Before that, it had been used for thousands of years by indigenous people before becoming a military reserve. Some indigenous people were living there in the late 19th century. There were also totems and more have been incorporated into the park since. Here is a photo from around 1888 showing mounds of clamshells being removed. Early images from the park show native canoeists, some of whom may have come from the indigenous community across the Narrows, where the Capilano River enters the sea from the North Shore. Indigenous art has since been commissioned, including for the popular Vancouver Aquarium in the park. Here are some First Nations canoeists who won a race in 1925, and a game of lacrosse being played in the park. That sport was invented by First Nations. When Stanley Park opened, the only way in was through a gate to a bridge across the tidal flats that led to what is now Lost Lagoon. It was at the end of a streetcar line, which many used to access the park. In the 1920s, a road was built after the Lost Lagoon was created by piping in seawater. In the late 1920s, the piping stopped and the lagoon became freshwater. The entrance to the park changed as a result with different looks over the years. Once the Stanley Park Causeway was widened to allow for traffic to the new bridge at the end of the 1930s, car traffic took on greater importance there. Initially, the North Shore was sparsely populated. The best connection to the city was by ferry to Lonsdale Quay. The area north of the park looked more pristine. That has changed as residential, industrial, and commercial developments came to the North Shore. Vancouver, too, grew south and east of Stanley Park. Early photos show only a few houses by the park. The area then grew in popularity, and by the 1960s, Vancouver's West End was one of Canada's most populous neighborhoods where residents could live close to the park. Vancouver's downtown developed too, with its great views of the park. And then the growing North Shore, especially once it was connected by bridge. The first narrows between Stanley Park and the mouth of the Capilano River could be treacherous, as seen by these 19th century photos of the wreck of the SS Beaver off Prospect Point. A lighthouse was built three months later and started operations just after the park opened. That's not far from Siwash Rock, near the northwest corner of the park. That rock is now easily accessed from the seawall and occasionally climbed, such as by UBC's Outdoor Club. Before the park opened, settlers, including Portuguese, Scots, and Chinese, had also built houses and shacks on the east and south sides, especially by Dead Man Island. By 1931, most residents in the park were evicted, but two who were old and childless 
were allowed to live out their days. That lasted longer than imagined, and the final longtime resident died in 1958. A popular photo destination in the park has been the hollow tree. It's many hundreds of years old and has been a prized spot for picture taking over the years. You can see its width here. The Stanley Park Drive was originally planned to go through where the tree stands, but popular opposition saved the old hollow tree and it can still be seen and photographed today. Transportation options to and around Stanley Park, so you can well see, have evolved over the years. At first, horse-drawn carriages, horseback riding, and arriving by foot were most common. Then bicycles were added and remain popular to this day. By the early 20th century, automobiles were also added. Then, the hollow tree became a popular location for photos with the driver's new horseless carriage. Cars continued to gain in popularity and reliability. Of course, not everyone had one, and the streetcar remained a popular way to reach the park. Then buses followed. Very few people arrived by seaplane or aircraft carrier. But they did come. Often families wanted to go bathing or swimming. Second Beach in Stanley Park has always been popular. Facilities were added over the years, including saltwater swimming pools filled with seawater at Second Beach and at Lumberman's Arch. By the arch, children could learn to swim for free, like in this photo from 1931. When swimming lessons weren't available, children still found a way to have fun. But those pools did need to be drained and cleaned sea life could enter along with the water. Children have always played on land too, among the trees, in organized races, or maypole dances, fishing derbies, at the old zoo, the petting zoo, or the Vancouver Aquarium. In 1961, traffic school was available so children could learn the rules of the road. The miniature train was an option for those who wanted to sit back. And running through sprinklers was for the more active. In the 1930s, a bridge over the first narrows between Stanley Park and the North Shore was planned. It took about two years to build. In 1938, the Lionsgate Bridge opened. with its Art Deco style. From the beginning, traffic was considerable. The Stanley Park Causeway, also known as the Lionsgate Bridge Road, helped move traffic through the park, connecting downtown Vancouver and North Vancouver. A road in the park had been built in the 1920s, but was widened for the bridge. Originally, the bridge was one lane each way. 
then a second lane, which switched ways depending on the direction of peak traffic, was carved off in the middle. The Lions Gate opened as a toll bridge with a toll plaza on the north side. Now the bridge is iconic and much photographed. The seawall underneath the bridge and along the seacoast of the park began in 1917 and took decades to complete. The original shore was often rocky and challenging for visitors. Paths were added early to aid movement, especially along the more protected parts. Work continued, and the last stone on the park portion of Vancouver's seawall was laid in 1971. Now, cyclists and walkers can enjoy 28 kilometers or 18 miles along an uninterrupted car-free trail. It and the park are most popular during the warm months, but Stanley Park is enjoyable year-round, even during the occasionally snowy or icy times. Skating is even sometimes possible on a pond or the Lost Lagoon. Now we say farewell to Stanley Park for now. Please like and follow this channel to receive future episodes, including about the Vancouver Aquarium. Thank you.